Welcome back and good afternoon. My name is Malcolm Campbell Verdun. I'm a senior lecturer in international political economy, a bit of a mouthful, uh, IPE for short, in the Faculty of Arts here at the University of Groningen. And uh, it's my pleasure to uh, moderate this panel. I was told about two hours ago that I'd be doing so. Um, so bear with me this afternoon. Um, yeah, I guess Oscar was looking to make this an all-female panel after the all-male panel that we just had and look for double-barreled last names. I often get called Mrs. Campbell Verdun in uh, Nederland, but uh, okay. Here I am. So yeah, I've worked um, in big data, um, regulation, governance, uh, particularly in finance on fintech uh, for quite some time now. I'm having the pleasure now of working on AI cryptos these days. If anybody's following this, it's, it's a mad, mad world out there. AI crypto together, hype squared if you want to call. So uh, the challenge of regulation in such an area you can imagine um, might be an outlier case for our discussions today. But uh, yeah, we have an interesting set of panelists. Before I uh, turn over the floor to them, I just give the outline. Uh, I think uh, you followed the same format in the first panel that I missed, yeah. So 10-minute uh, presentations um, and then kind of opening statements, uh, giving some background uh, from each of the presenters, and then we'll just open up the panel for discussion. Some of the questions I thought might be relevant, um, I know you were handed some questions already, but just uh, some kind of broad ones that I might poke at uh, uh, in the discussion if uh, we're all having the mid-afternoon dip are ones about, um, you know, we have this huge formal set of rules coming our way, um, but rules have existed for a long time in the governance of technology broadly, in AI specifically, right? They might be rules from the private sector, right? but what happens once governments get more formally involved? And that's uh, kind of the big meta issue, I think, that we're addressing these days. What are the degrees of kind of preemptive compliance, preemptive uh, skirting the rules, preemptive shaping of these rules that we're seeing um, that all kind of fall under this banner of uh, anticipatory governance, uh, some of the forms of governance that I've been working on. Uh, so another broad question that comes out of this is how do innovation and regulation uh, go hand in hand? How does uh, the advent of all these rules affect the day-to-day -day work of regulators? Do we get new tasks as, as regulators? I'm saying we because I'm also kind of an academic regulator here myself. Um, and just generally, how does the kind of perception of what a regulator is and what a regulator should do uh, change uh, with the advent of these rules, these formal rules? Uh, so yeah, we'll have a lot of kind of more specific uh, uh, answers, I think, to these questions, but I just want to set the stage with the broad questions at this stage. And since I'm an international political economist, I'd like to hear any thoughts on the kind of international dimensions that you might bring to the table here. Um, so uh, yeah, learning or impacts uh, within Europe, but also beyond Europe would be interesting uh, to put on the table this afternoon. Okay, so uh, maybe we just go one at a time, starting with um, Catherine uh, Jess Sarand, if I'm pronouncing your name right, uh, who's an assistant professor here at the university and has um, a postdoc that you just completed, I, I guess, um, in an amazingly named um, EU-funded project called DataFace. So I imagine that uh, inspired the name of the title of the panel. Yes, well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yes, thank you very much. So thank you very much and uh, good afternoon. Um, as Malcolm said, uh, I'm uh, now, uh, I've just joined the University of Groningen, or rejoined the University of Groningen to work on, on AI biometrics and, uh, and defects. Um, but before I was uh, doing a research, so I was doing a research on facial recognition. I actually got uh, European funding, Marie Curie, to do research on facial recognition technologies. They are used uh, by public authorities, uh, mainly police in public spaces, and how uh, this use impact, uh, had an impact on the right uh, to data protection and privacy. So I have to say that I started the research, so I did the research at KU Leuven in Belgium, a city. I started the research before uh, the European Commission proposed the AI Act, but of course the regulation of facial recognition was, was everywhere. And, and that's why also I studied this research and I proposed it, so to bring uh, maybe an international aspect. Um, I look at what was happening in 2018-19. I look at France, the UK, the, USA, the US, and China. And I found that there was a kind of trend, so I don't know if we can uh, call it a trend, but in the United States, uh, you had some researcher that, that, that found that made research and they found that uh, some uh, commercial uh, 
uh, facial uh, detection algorithms uh, were actually biased. It's, it's a joy of Buolamni and, and uh, Tinit uh, Rebrur. So they wrote a very important paper on that. But at the same time, you had some cities in the United States that started to ban the use of facial recognition technologies in public spaces, in the streets. Uh, they wanted to prevent the police to use that. So San Francisco started uh, the movement and several uh, cities followed. So you had these uh, cities in the United States that were banning. Then in France, uh, in 2019, the, the city hall, the city uh, municipality of Nice, tested facial recognition during the carnival uh, session on volunteers. And then beside that, you had in the UK, many police forces tried the technologies, but what they did is that they tried technologies, but they also arrested people. So they had ad hoc watch list. And uh, when people discovered that, they were quite angry, of course, because they were not informed, they didn't have uh, the possibility to opt out, but there was no transparency on this. And then you had China. Uh, we discussed a lot about China because there were uh, different uh, reports uh, saying that it was easy to allocate anyone in a few minutes in some, uh, in some cities. Uh, because, uh, because actually uh, there was a network of surveillance already existing and they had planned to uh, deploy uh, millions, hundreds of millions of cameras uh, to support the social scoring systems. So I was looking at that and I was looking at also uh, the existing uh, frameworks, regulatory frameworks. And what we had uh, at that time was only data protection rules. And these rules, I think it was clearly explained before these rules, it's about the processing of personal data, biometric data, personal data, the obligation of data controllers, processors, but not about the technologies themselves. So you didn't have a regulation of the technologies themselves, or the, the, the development and, and the use of these technologies. And that's why the AI, AI Act is actually trying to provide, so beyond the data protection rules, it's regulating, uh, so it's not regulating facial recognition technologies. It's regulating remote biometric identification systems. Uh, the commission first wanted to regulate facial recognition technologies. There was uh, a white paper written and, and a draft white paper that leaked in uh, 2020, in January 2020. And then there, it was about regulation of facial recognition technologies. But then, uh, in the final, uh, in the official proposal, it has been replaced by remote biometric identification systems. Because, of course, you have many technologies that you can use uh, to try to identify people at distance without their uh, collaboration or cooperation. And then there was a distinction made between retrospective use and real-time use. Uh, and with a ban for law enforcement uh, uh, purposes in real time in public spaces, accepted in three cases. I say partial ban because actually the three cases, even if the commission said that they are limiti limited uh, cases, they can be potentially very broad. Uh, but in the final text, what is interesting and that was not in the proposal, is that the use of facial recognition technology uh, for uh, post events so retrospective, uh, once the event has happened, uh, for comparison purposes, is subject to conditions. And initially in the proposal, that was not the case. And these conditions is prior authorization, information given to individuals, and also a fundamental right impact assessment. And this is very interesting. So, so the, these conditions, you find them as well uh, for the three cases uh, in which uh, real-time use of facial recognition is allowed by the police. But what I want to say is that a lot of, of um, media attention was on real-time use. But the police, they also want to use for retrospective uh, purposes. And currently in France, there is a framework for that. Uh, there is a framework to, uh, to uh, perform facial recognition against uh, databases. And the fact that the AI Act uh, was discussed and adopted during my project has also forced me to refocus a bit my research. The reason is because everyone was writing about facial recognition, of course, but it's also uh, what I could bring in, in this discussion uh, when you have a lot of researchers, uh, NGOs, but also law enforcement authorities that are writing about it. Uh, it's not only about research, huh? it's also uh, they are writing position papers. 
So I decided to look at experiments, and, and I wrote a chapter uh, for a book that uh, Oscar edited, because the problem that I found is that these experiments, you could find them in France, in the UK, and, and other uh, countries, but there was no specific uh, regulatory framework for these experiments. And what I found problematic as well is that experiments by police, they should not fall under the LED, the Law Enforcement Directive, but under the GDPR, because the purpose of this experiment, except in the UK, it was not to arrest some people, but it was to test the system. But the problem as well with these experiments is that they were not uh, uh, designed in the way that you could audit them afterwards. So what happened in France uh, as an experiment, there is no data to assess whether it was a good experiment or not. But based on this experiment, uh, you had a lot of uh, public authority that asked for the deployment of the technologies in real time. Uh, then I decided to focus on Clearview AI. It was quite new at that time. It was so, so Clearview AI, for the, the ones who don't know, it's a face uh, database uh, constituted of images that have been scrapped online together with metadata and personal information. And the difference of, uh, of Clearview AI with other type of uh, database is that it provides a profile of, a, of, of anyone, actually, which, which has a presence online. You, you could try to find yourself, but maybe you don't want to do that because you don't want your image to end up in this database in case it's not already uh, there. Um, so that, that was a uh, second point, but in the Artificial Intelligence Act, this type of database is actually prohibited, uh, which, which is also consistent with decisions taken by uh, several data protection authorities in the EU that find the company for scrapping our faces without any uh, legal uh, basis. And then I look at the principle of necessity. So this was one of my last work because I wanted to check um, if the conditions, so uh, the right to fundamental, uh, to, to data protection is a fundamental right, privacy as well, but they are not absolute and you can limit them provided you follow some specific conditions, so legality, necessity, and proportionality. Uh, proportionality, you make a balance between the interests, between the rights. And necessity is, is often a, a forgotten uh, principle, I think. It's about looking at alternative uh, solutions, alternative uh, possibilities to obtain th the same result, but also uh, objective evidence. And what I found is that in the proposal for the AI Act, there was no uh, objective evidence that these technologies are necessary for the purpose. And, and I think that's what was missing uh, in the end. So, uh, in short, that's what I can say about my research and uh, facial recognition and technologies. Uh, merci beaucoup. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, it's a bit longer. <laughs> One other thing that was missing, if I can say, yes. was the title of this book that Oscar edited oh, with, yes, uh, yes. Yeah, Sorry, with you, Andre. Sorry, you also contributed. And that's the fantastic uh, uh, part of this event, is we get to meet other contributors to the <laughs> same book for the first time. So, excellent. Yes. Um, and the book is actually called The Handbook of uh, Politics and Governance of Big Data and AI. Um, I think it's open access or not? No. No, no, it's no, not. no, no, no. Okay, just the introduction. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so it's my pleasure now to uh, give the floor to Malvina Nissim, uh, who's Professor of Computational Linguistics and Society. I've got that right? Yeah. Yes, excellent. In, uh, yeah, my faculty, the best faculty of the University Faculty of Arts. Yes. Thank you. I can only agree. Uh, yeah. So instead of having a slide that says again my name and uh, where I'm from and all that, I put that. <laughs> I think that's uh, quite explicative of where we stand in, in the field. You all know what that is, right? Anyone who doesn't? No, okay, so in the past it was very hard to describe what I was working on. People would ask me, what do you do? Computational linguists, I always wished I could say I'm a doctor because it's so much easier. But now we have that, and that is not coming out of nothing. That uh, is a model, in this case is uh, ChatGPT. And is ChatGPT is a model built on a large language model, and the large language model is built by having a lot of data, textual data, but now not only, although we still call it language model, in input, and then some stuff happens, and then you'll get some text in output. So 
there's input, there's a system, and there's output. Of course, this system is not only ChatGPT, it's not only the GPT 3.5 or GPT 4, it's any large language model that is being built. I've just seen a survey yesterday that there is like a surge of any sort of model now being built, uh, available, not available, open, closed. And somebody was mentioning earlier, I think it was Michael, uh, hugging face, is, uh, you, you find all the possible models. And what you might want to do, actually, you might want to regulate the system, which is a lot done also in the act. Um, but also you might think of wanting to regulate the input and wanting to regulate the output. And I'm going to look a little bit at this from my perspective, which is a researcher's perspective who knows very little about regulation and has dreams and all that. Um, <laughs> But because I know very little, I actually went to check that uh, because it concerns us. So the Act says that the Parliament's priority is to make sure that AI systems used in the EU are safe, transparent, traceable, non-discriminatory and environmentally friendly. And all, uh, all syst AI systems should be overseen by people rather than automation to prevent harmful outcomes. I don't know if you have uh, ever seen the password game you know what that is? So my kids play that a lot. It's basically an impossible game where you have to navigate a number of constraints. So it will say this passport is valid if it has so many digits, but the digits have to sum up to that. But then they also have to be uh, atomic numbers in the periodic table, and then you have to have this uh, year. So it's impossible to actually do that, have a valid password. And actually this felt a little bit like that to me. You want to have it safe, transparent, traceable, and non-discriminatory and environmentally friendly. It all see and overseen by people. And my question also at the end will be which people? So to me, this is rarely discussed, but like those who are, and you want international view, those who are making the regulations, those who are building the model, those who are deciding what's harmful and what's not harmful. It's always a small bunch of people. And we were talking about involvement of NGOs uh, or limited involvement of NGOs. So to me, that's, that's an issue. So this comes from the Act. Uh, so here, you know, they talk about uh, safe. So let's look a, a second about safety. So there's some stuff that is basically uh, the limited risk. The only thing you need to do is to be transparent. Uh, so there's instead the unacceptable risk that says that uh, AI systems are considered to threat, a threat to people and will be banned. And they include cognitive behavioral manipulation of people or specific vulnerable groups, for example, voice activated toys that encourage dangerous behavior in children. This is in, it's in the act, right? Yeah. So there was this thing that happened with Alexa. Uh, so Alexa is a model, is a voice model, is a language model. So it tells 10-year-old girl to touch life plug with penny. Right? Uh, Alexa, I think, is not, <laughs> it's not going to be banned. Right? So where does this danger come from? Where why is it dangerous? Well, you might say, well, people, parents left child alone with Alexa, so where's the responsibility? But, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. But I think the problem doesn't come from the system itself, right? It's not, to me, that's not Alexa to be banned, although this would be like encouraging dangerous behavior in children. Um, this happened in 2013. So a Polish worker was seriously injured in a dumper track because he followed instructions that were automatically translated and they were wrong. So I followed instructions and there was an accident. And uh, of course, this is a problem. You might say, well, now it's not 2013. Translations are so much better, but the problem stays. And in this case, you might just go like, OK, let's be transparent and always state that something is automatically translated as requested. But that might not be enough. Uh, because anyway, we live by things that are translated anyway. So there was a case recently of a Flixbus message. Uh, this was two years ago at the beginning of the war between uh, uh, Russia and uh, Ukraine. And it was saying that people uh, who wanted to leave Ukraine, depending on nationality, could have a service or so. And that's a, a, a wrong translation. So people were saying, what do you mean, depending on nationality? And the actual translation should have been, 
you know, irrespective of nationality. And this, you know, you see this here, usually indicates automatic translation. So in a way, there is some transparency there. I wonder whether that's sufficient. I don't know if we are looking at the right problem in a way. So I do agree that there should be a stamp saying this is automatically generated, this is automatically translated. I fully agree with that. I'm not sure that that's enough. Uh, also, if you just look at Google Translate, you know you're going to use an automatic translation, right? You go yourself onto Google Translate. I want to show you a small example. Anyone speaking Hungarian? Okay, can you confirm that this is... So in Hungarian, you have one single character that stands for pronoun that is both female and male. So if you translate into English and you want to have it grammatical, you will have to have either he or she. And these are all predicates that say something. This is quite readable even for us dumb who don't speak Hungarian. But, you know, the predicates are like that. Cooks is clever, raises a child, is a professor, is a cleaner, and so on. So the translation can be either way. She cooks, he cooks, he's clever, she's clever, right? So if you want to have it in English, you have to have the pronoun there. And you can imagine what happens. You can, right? Why can you? I'll show you. <laughs> right? Exactly, experience and based on everything we see. So the translation with that, the, uh, the predicates like beautiful and, and such uh, were <laughs> associated to female. Yeah, and you're like, oh my God, no, that's so bad, that's so bad. Really, it's so bad, we use it every day. These are the systems, these are the language models at the base of the systems that are used every day. And this is, is, pop is popping up, right? Because I make a point by showing this, but everything you translate has this kind of biases within. Everything, okay? Now, so there's an input, there's a system, and there's the output. So the input is language, and we have 7, 000, oh, over 7,000 languages in the world. We have variations of all sorts, but eventually the input for these models is, I've been kind, over 80% English, but it's actually almost 95% English for even the multilingual models. Data comes from social media, data comes from Wikipedia, which we believe like, is quite you know, factual. But Wikipedia, do you know the percentage of female writers on Wikipedia? Con female contributors on Wikipedia? 15? That's correct. It's about 15%. Now, you can imagine that the language we use reflects society, reflects culture, and if only like a very small slice of the population is represented, I'm only talking about female, but you can imagine all the variations. Michael, you asked for, uh, Michael, you asked for international. You know, so much that is not represented there. So representativity and accessibility is an issue there. And there, of course, in output, there's an issue of representativity, accountability, and ownership, because who owns? the texts that are being produced. I think this is a topic also for the next uh, panel. So there was already, and it wasn't, it was pre-GPT, well, chat GPT, but GPTs were there. There was already like, you know, this discussion on what happens if we produce text at scale that can be just, you know, can be anything. It can be harmful, it can be fake, can be anything. So who owns it? And who's responsible for spreading fake news in this sense? So. That's a problem also that's being discussed in terms of open and closed systems. So if I'm not wrong, and I'm almost finishing, the, the, there are exceptions in the AI Act regarding open systems. Is that correct? Yeah, but if, you, if it's open or closed, <laughs> you know, open is better. And I would always go for open, but it doesn't remove all of these problems that are there. It does not. So you might make it... What I wanted to make the point for is that I think... The act might be necessary, it might be, but it might not be looking for what I'm concerned at the right things. What I would look at, <laughs> uh, what I think that you should do, of course, while working on regulations, is also working on something else. Because regulations often happens post-drama. <laughs> and a lot of the drama is happening outside of the EU. We are very much behind in language model development, in, in deployment. We're like, you know, the US and the companies based in the US are a different thing. So if we do not, at the same time, during development, do regulation, like together, I think we are always going to be behind and we're always going to end up regulating 
somebody else's products or somebody else's research. And I think that's just very wrong from my perspective. So what we need to do is that the EU needs to regulate while like funding research, funding like huge computing power. You know, there's this, the CERN for physics. Why can't we have something like that for AI, like a network of research centers or a core research centers that is really funded properly within which you can devise regulations and mostly literacy and inclusiveness. Like if people know what they are f working with, they're always better protected. And that's that. Thanks so much. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I guess it's good that Oscar did not outsource moderation of this panel to an AI chatbot. Uh, <laughs> so good that I'm here. Um, next up, we have Elise Niemeyer, yeah, um, who's a graduate of the Ruch and uh, current DPO. I think we all here know what DPO stands for, but uh, you're at the RDV. And does anybody know what the R in RDV stands for? Yeah, but not anymore, apparently. Wow. Yeah. So I'll let you explain that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thanks. Data protection officer. So I'm the super supervisor on the privacy within RDW. So the D, uh, D, uh, GDPR, uh, the EU uh, legislation. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, often we are called Rijksdienst voor het Wegverkeer. That's, that's like 25 years old. We've been... Uh, 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 made independent, and now we are the Dienstwegverkeer, or still the RD, uh, RDW. Um, and not very known, perhaps, but we are uh, an independent administrative body and a large uh, employer in the north of the Holland. We have uh, three offices in the Groningen province. Uh, we have a large register, so we have all the vehicles in the Netherlands and their owners. We also issue driver's licenses. Um, and today I'm going to talk about two different perspectives. Uh, firstly, uh, we are the type approval authority of the Netherlands. Uh, and I'm also going to talk about RDW from the user perspective. Uh, so, oops. First, uh, type approval agency perspective. Uh, RDW uh, um, uh, issues type approvals for all kinds of vehicles. Uh, so if we give a EU type approval, for example, uh, Tesla, which we have, then you may register this vehicle in all the countries of the EU. And you can see here that uh, cars have changed over the past from uh, technical machines to driving computers. Um, it disposes a lot of challenges for uh, RDW because when uh, um, a software is updated, it now becomes an entirely different vehicle like uh, has been proven by the diesel gate. Um, there are uh, uh, three uh, directives, cybersecurity software updates and uh, automatic lane keeping systems. Uh, which are now being uh, brought within the scope of type approval. Uh, and this means a legislative uh, game changer because we were used to work with closed norms. For example, if a car breaks, it takes so many meters to stop. And now we're moving towards open norms. For example, we have to say if uh, uh, the changing of lanes is, uh, is safe. Well, how do you dis decide if that is uh, safe? Um, and this means also a lot for supervision. Uh, how do you determine whether it is safe to drive a vehicle in the future or in the long term? And this is the same uh, picture that uh, Tim used. So there are approximately uh, 60 market regulators within uh, uh, the Netherlands. And 20 of those are uh, fall within the scopes of the annexes of the uh, AI Act. For vehicles, it's uh, ELT, that's the market regulator. So not RDW, we're just a type approval agency. Uh, but the AIX does say there, uh, it opens a possibility for implement implementing legislation. Uh, and that is, is expected within a few years. Uh, it probably is based on uh, self-declaration by the manufacturers to say they comply 
And uh, yeah, and then there will be some sort of uh, conformity audits. And now the AI user perspective. Uh, as part of the government, we of course want to uh, comply to the AI Act. And how have we done that over the past uh, several years? Uh, we has, have established a working group uh, um, reporting to the highest level within RDW. Uh, we have uh, tracked versions of the directive and uh, provided input to our ministry for the negotiations. Uh, we uh, established a centralized <coughs> knowledge hub, multidisciplinary, uh, so there's uh, lawyers, uh, people from IT, technical people, uh, a privacy, all working together. Um, and we uh, incorporate AI in a risk-based privacy approach. And this is quite unique as I know, uh, as far as I know, because if you hear, hear consultants, they often say you must, uh, AI doesn't always have uh, personal information, so you should do the risk-based uh, approach separately. But how often do you have no personal information at all. So RDW said we, we are going to incorporate it. And if we have AI without personal information, we just do the same and follow the privacy uh, uh, procedures we have in place. Um, well, we use the agile approach. So we just started uh, two years ago with common sense. And uh, we uh, uh, have a positive experience with using uh, graduate su students who have uh, develop developed the projects for us. And how does this um, practical implementation look like? Uh, first you have here the, the uh, four risk categories from the AI uh, Act on the left. Uh, I heard that in the la latest version there were only three left. So they incorporated the, the low and the um, limited risk as a one. Perhaps I heard, we have to check. Uh, but it doesn't make any difference because there were no obligations with the fourth category. Uh, on the right of the triangle you see uh, the RDW policy. What do you have to do if there is AI with which falls within the range? Um, and this was... Um, uh, well, uh, translated to an Excel document on the right, um, fitting for RDW. So you answer the questions and the Excel says uh, uh, how high the risk of the AI is. And it al also says uh, what the measures are you need to take to be compliant. Uh, here is, well, in case of a limited or high risk, you have to be transparent. Uh, RDW does that via an al uh, algorithm register. Um, and we don't only do it for AI, but also for normal algorithms, uh, which could affect citizens, so it's, it's a bit broader. Uh, and on the right you see a page from uh, our uh, DPA, Data Processing Impact Assessment uh, template. Uh, this is a government template, all, all government agencies usually use this one, but we added uh, some own stuff to it. Uh, firstly, for uh, the description of the AI. Uh, the description uh, is uh, depending on the risk category, how, how higher the risk, how more you have to describe. Uh, but also stuff like uh, uh, human impact, uh, human rights in general, this goes further than uh, privacy you have to do with in case of a high risk. Uh, RDW also included an ethical uh, paragraph uh, to this uh, DPA. Uh, um, and uh, if the, after the, there is a final version, of course, we have to look if the, the policy or the documents need to be changed. Uh, we have had contact with the uh, Ministry of Interior Affairs, who are in uh, charge of this uh, template, to see if they can use uh, stuff uh, uh, well, students have developed for us. So, that's my uh, presentation. Great, thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Well.
I guess the question from the students where the jobs could be after graduation uh, has been answered somewhat. Okay, well then you have the machine translation, right? <laughs> Okay, so uh, thanks for answering some of my questions from earlier. I'm going to keep them on the back burner, the larger questions. And, uh, you know, if nobody else has uh, questions, I'll answer, oh, I'll ask them again. But uh, first, just to open it up, because we only have about 15 minutes left. So please uh, start us off. Hi, it's for Catherine. Uh, I'm originally from Hong Kong, so I'm very, very interested in or very sensitive towards facial recognition for obvious reason. Um, as far as I know, uh, there is a U-turn in the uh, EU legislator with regard to what you mentioned about the uh, authority use in the retrospect uh, use of uh, uh, open source or their database, uh, especially with facial recognition technology. What is your opinion on that? Why they have a U-turn? Is this more like a political change? Because in the first draft, it wasn't like that, as you mentioned. And then in your research, you also mentioned that you studied the Chinese social scoring system. For those who don't know, it's basically in China, there's like thousands upon thousands of CCTV everywhere in the city. They could recognize you and all your detail in seconds. Like if you litter, if you have a fight, if, if anything you do, it's recognized immediately with your social score number, with your address, with all the details. Um, I wonder if, this is sort of like a sub-question, because we have a comparison between the full use of this technology in China and a partial use of technology that is coming up in the EU. What is, in your research, can we learn something from the Chinese system or the issue that come out of the Chinese system? Uh, because I'm quite worried that with this U-turn, I feel less protected uh, being in the EU, especially being a Hong Kong citizen, if you understand mm -hmm. the underlying concern. Yeah, thank you. So thank you very much for your question. So I should have said that um, my research originally I had planned to go to China for a field visit to, to discuss with some companies and I couldn't do it because of the pandemic. But the topic became too sensitive as well. So instead, I uh, worked on a paper with a, with a visiting scholar from China, but we could not uh, touch upon the very political issues. And, and of course, it's also not our topic. Our topic is, is a legal one. But I, I understand completely uh, your concern. Concerning uh, this retrospective use of, of facial recognition technology or the biometric technologies, so originally in the proposal, it was still high risk, huh? but there were not specific conditions for the use. Then the Parliament uh, proposed to prohibit the use of these technologies, except in very uh, narrow cases. It was extremely narrow what the Parliament proposed. But you have also to understand that some member states, including France, were already using retrospective uh, facial recognition technologies to identify uh, uh, suspect uh, potential criminals. And then they didn't want to have a total ban or even a partial ban on, this, uh, on these uh, technologies. So what's, what's also we don't realize is that this AI Act, it's not uh, regulating everything about post-use. Because if you have some surveillance cameras installed in the street, it's not going to be regulated by the AI Act. It will be based on national uh, rules, uh, criminal uh, procedural law. And that's the case in France. But the AI Act will only regulate if you can do the processing of these images that are captured. And, uh, and, and I understand your concern, but, but, but I think there was pressure from, from governments for that. Pressure from the police, because the police really wanted to be able to use it for uh, retrospective uh, use. And uh, they were afraid that the position uh, that the parliament adopted in June uh, would be uh, the position, the, the, the final position. But, uh, but, but I'm very surprised that they were afraid that it would be the final position because we, we also know that within the parliament there were uh, some um, dissension or uh, not all political groups agreed on that. Um, so I think retrospective use has been done in the past as well and, and, and you have national uh, regime for that. 
Um, but, but you might know as well that in France, f for the Olympic Games, you will have also uh, algorithmic processing of uh, images uh, that will allow to, uh, to detect uh, crowd movement. So they say they don't do facial recognition, they will not do facial recognition. But in the end, they have everything in place to do retrospective uh, facial recognition. So, so I think uh, that sometimes on these topics, you have some statement made which don't match what is actually happening. So saying we don't do facial recognition for the Olympic Games might not be the truth because they already have a retrospective use of the regulatory regime for that in France. And, and I understand your concern, but uh, I don't know, uh, maybe you have to try to be uh, as uh, um, not noticeable as possible, <laughs> I don't know what to say, but yeah. I'm not sure that uh, I can answer your concerns. Yeah, thanks for starting yes. us off with yes, the international no, no, dimension. I really yes. appreciate that and the extensive response. Um, I'm not seeing other hands up. Maybe it's the, oh yeah, great, thank you. Uh, yes, I have a smaller <coughs> question uh, for you. Um, you talked about how you think we should also regulate the input for larger systems to kind of mitigate biased outcomes in the end. But how do you, how do you look at data and decide whether it is actually fair data, quote unquote, especially with large amounts of data? Um, that's an excellent question, and I actually, what I think is that there is in a way little attention to the regulation of the input, but in a way I don't think it should be done in terms of laws, or my, I do a lot of research on that, and my point is that in a way we should not <laughs> uh, regulate the input, we should not alter the input, um, because the people who would decide, I mean, who would decide what's to be debiased and how to debias, and there's, and there's always the same, let's say, group of people who would work on this, and they are the people who are normally not represented by the bias problems. And what I see as the actual core issue is that there is debiasing done, and ChatGPT, OpenAI, says that ChatGPT has been cleared, it's on the first page, has been cleared, or, or at least attempt at clearing it from harmful <coughs> output, from bias in the model. And if you just prompt it in different ways, the bias is there. Mm. So I find it incredibly dangerous that we have this illusion that there, is, there are cleaner models where the bias is just hidden at different levels and uh, through different patterns. So what I believe is that there should be a lot of <coughs> funding devoted to understanding better how these models work and how we can make them more transparent in their decisions, even if they are biased decisions. At least the user will know, I made this decision in the job ad and matching the CV because this person is a woman and I don't think that women are adequate for this job. So in that sense, then it's evident there and it's not just a hidden decision. I find it very dangerous as well to try and impose debiasing in certain ways. A, because who decides what's bias and who decides how we debias? And B, because it gives the false impression that these models now are safer. Great, okay, over here please. Thanks, I have a question for Malvina. Um, you give the example of the Google Translate system, um, and I, you probably, maybe you know, probably know Google, but two years ago, uh, didn't fix that problem, but applied a fix on top of it, right? So now their user interface will always display if you do Hungarian, it'll say he is and she is separately. And that's a user interface fix on top of a model, on top of the model output. Um, uh, I mean, I think at the time it was led by Meg Mitchell, but the, the changes they made, but still, like as you mentioned just a second ago, it's, it's a kind of botch on top of a model which is very hard to deeply uh, remove the problems from, and you were just using it as an indication. But that links to my broader question. If we're saying that we can't uh, really deal with the challenges by changing the input data and we can't really tweak the models to make them sanitized, how much does that oblige us to put open models and models produced by research behind user interface walls where the outputs are being further classified and reduced, almost turning our world into a kind of walled garden API world um, compared to openly sharing the models uh, around there? And how much do you think that 
might cause problems for researchers who might start to then rely or have to rely on APIs and closed and proprietary models as the best ones in the class. Um, also the ones that have got the safety features attached to them as well that make them suitable for use um, rather than having to deal with the models themselves. Because it's a quite a political economy question of where we link the safeguards to who controls them, to who has the gateway and to what stage in your, in your three point frame they are placed. Yeah, no, it, it's an excellent question. I, I don't have a precise answer. Um, I think, so uh, dividing between like open source and not might be, a, I mean, I, I want everything to be open source and I think research also should be done on open source and it should be like weights available for, for the models, but also all the information about training data, right? So that is, of course, to me, it's a requirement to do proper and safe uh, or better, better models. So I do not, I don't, so if, if the companies are putting safety nets on their models or on their input by doing the biasing, my problem with that is that we might get the impression that they are safer. But I don't think they fully are. I think, so it's, it, you're right that now there's the, you know, they implemented the, the double, you know, both the options. But if I search for, like, uh, Malvina as a professor, it will give me both options. If I search for Malvina as a full professor, it will not. Yeah? So it's still, it, and it feels like, okay, well, I have the options. It's very good. It's not, it, it, it's not, it's not true. So, or it's not true at a deeper level. So I, I'm not sure what the best course of action is, but what I feel is that trying to attach safety at a very superficial level is incredibly misleading. Mm. And I'm not sure what we should do, <laughs> but apart from keep on working on interpretability and transparency of everything in the pipeline. So from input data, and I'm not saying we should necessarily clean it or debias it because A, we're not sure exactly how to do it in, a, in an efficient way and in a uh, true way, but also who decides what bias is? Am I debias for gender, make it fair, and I'm destroying a whole community of speakers because all the work is done on English and then if I do that, the, that language is, the other language is completely messed up because I don't know that language, but I work on English. It's, it's incredibly delicate and to me, before we just decide that this has to be this, this, this way, and safety is such, such, such. We need to just do more research. We're not ready for that at all. And probably that doesn't answer your question, but um, <laughs> that... Uh, <laughs> Good luck with Netherlands or KPT. These are fantastic questions. You got the international and the political economy one, which is speaking right to my heart. So thanks so much. Uh, so this side of the room has been great. Um, is there <laughs> this side? I'm gonna go there next, but come right back there after. Uh, yes, hello, this is uh, Giulio Orzani. I'm a data steward with uh, UGDCC. Um, so I, I was kind of interested in this idea of having a CERN for AI, but um, the, um, let's say the concern at the moment that we're hearing most at the, at the university is also that there's students and PhD students that are using AI for certain tasks and that that could become a problem maybe for critical thinking in that stage. Um, so let's say we get a CERN for AI. It's gonna take some time until some results or some decisions will come out of that CERN. Is it possible that we reach a critical mass at some point where certain things will become unavoidable uh, in the use or it, the, the bias that's introduced by the AI will become uh, uh, the, the, the use of the AI will become so widespread that the bias will not be removable, in a sense. If well, yeah. I'm not sure whether the question is, is yeah, clear. Yeah. I'm I think struggling a bit. <laughs> well, uh, uh, shall I answer? Yeah, please. Yeah, so, uh, I think it's uh, the use is already unavoidable, in a way. Uh, it's there, and... I've been talking about this in several occasions on what we should do with education, and I think we should help students understand how these tools work and make the best out of them. I don't think 
that they will destroy critical thinking as calculators have not destroyed mathematical abilities, but we need to guide students into understanding what these tools can do and how they can best be leveraged not to destroy critical thinking. And in terms of biases, it, yes, I think it's a problem. And one of the big problems is that a lot of the new models are trained using automatically generated data, synthetic data. Knowing that, but also not knowing that, because a lot of, a lot of the stuff that it's now online and the new models are trained with a lot of data that is available <laughs> online, uh, you know, this data is automatically generated that we know it or not. So that is why I think it's a big problem just to think that we might be dealing with safer data and producing it like at scale and then reusing it in training new models. So, and that is also why, so to me, it's not just the application that might be dangerous or high risk, it's the representation of like groups or people that comes out in writing that can be dangerous because of how things are just expressed by a model that has learned certain biases or certain positions. So just the text itself can be actually a danger. And at the same time, I'm not saying that we should actually stop everything at all. I'm on the other side. Um, but in terms of, yeah, not being able to remove the bias, uh, I don't know, uh, have we ever removed any bias from the societies? Uh, we have not. Uh, we're still there. We're working on things. And, you know, it's not that they're, these two are separate aspects. I think we should work. What worries me is that we try to work on models and we forget about <laughs> society and, and culture. And that is why I'm, I think transparency and interpretability and accountability as well are, are key in a way more than debiasing. So I'm a bit afraid even that we just remove stuff so that it's, it feels not visible, but it's still visible in subtle ways. And we forget about actually where all the bias comes from, which is our own writing and our own uh, cultures that are expressed through language. Okay, we have one more minute for one last question. And since Elise has not had a question yet, I'm going to prioritize a question for Elise if there is one. Oh, so yours was not for Elise. Okay, is it for the whole panel or a select person? Uh, mostly, mostly for uh, Catherine. Yeah. Yes. Mm. But I've spoken up already. No Other takers? Okay. Uh, nerdy legal question. So we have um, uh, um, um, case law in Europe where the Court of Justice of the European Union basically says collecting metadata about everybody's um, communications, even for an important goal as, such as fighting terrorism, is not allowed because it's mass surveillance. And um, yeah, can we apply all that case law, all the lessons from that case law, can we um, apply it to um, uh, large-scale facial recognition systems or are there hurdles of applying those lessons to large-scale facial recognition? Well, maybe what I could have, should have said is that uh, the system or the, the regulatory approach uh, regarding facial recognition technologies, it's, n it's not going to be uh, large-scale because you can only use uh, this technology if you have a, a target. So it's prohibited to, the, to do mass surveillance. There is a recital, so Frédéric, there is no recitals actually in the... <laughs> <laughs> there is a recital about that, and uh, and maybe that's that's where we can find safeguards as well. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's also which kind of database you will use. And what we see is that a large-scale database such as ClearUI is not allowed for the moment. But I don't know in the future actually, and and we don't know exactly what it, what is done. So you have rules and. Uh, and you don't know uh, what some forces might do or, or, or law enforcement might do. Uh, they tested Clearview AI in some, in some countries, uh, but they didn't have the, any uh, uh, authorization to do that. They still uh, did it. Uh, and I think if you have the databases available, even if you should not use them, yeah. So um, I don't know if, if it's what you want to hear, but mass surveillance, it's not something that's, that will be allowed with the Artificial Intelligence Act. Great. 
Okay, last chance for a question for Elise. Otherwise, I'm going to ask you all about my driving that you're tracking, I guess, right now. Um, but yeah, you, you've been working so hard. I so. feel kind of like I'm breaking the fourth wall here. No, it's okay. uh, but I have a question for you, Melvina, since you talked about <laughs> the dangers of de uh, regulating biases. What is your opinion on, from like a regulator's point of view, su a substantive right to be informed on the issues? Sorry, I missed the last bit you said. So what do you think uh, about a, a regulator trying to create a right to be informed by anyone that uses AI? Okay, so a regulator being informed being no, like a right for customers and pretty much everyone in society to be informed about the dangers and biases you talked about. Oh, no, absolutely. Well, I think we should all be informed. Is but that... Do you believe that should be a legal right or a societal aim? Well, that's a question I really do not know how to answer. Is it, yeah, I, I appreciate the question. I really do not know how to answer because my legal knowledge is so limited that I don't even know whether this would be something that could be legalized un unless we're, we're talking about like, obliging anyone who's using generative AI or any AI decision tool, uh, AI-based decision tool, to explicitly say that this was the product of AI. So in that sense, maybe, maybe yes, uh, however, the I think is so everything is so blurred that say that you you just do something where uh, is, does it apply to individuals as well? Like say that a translator is writing a book, uh, is translating a book, and sometimes it gets some help from Google Translate. Does this have to be declared? I'm, I'm keeping it very like zero risk, right? Or almost zero risk. So would this need to be declared? Where is that? The, is that the final decision that is AI based? Or, you know, to me, it's not obvious where it's so encapsulated in all what we're doing now that it's not even obvious that it's clear when it is no AI or yes AI. Okay, one thing that is, is obvious it? is that that was one long minute. So I'll just uh, <laughs> stop the discussion there. We have some legal uh, experts coming up on the next panel. So maybe Good. we can uh, continue this discussion then. I want to thank you very much for your questions, your attention, and of course, your presentations. Big round of applause. Mm -hmm.